So in previous presentations, we have explored how there was widespread cultural interaction between civilizations in the third millennium BC, from the Indus to the Oxus to the Mediterranean. In this presentation, we will begin to look at how among the vast variety of people brought into contact during this period were two important pastoralist populations, or as they are popularly known, nomads, who would play a prominent role in the subsequent history of these lands. So these two groups were in the north of the system what we might call various Indo-European language-speaking people, and along the southern reaches, primarily between Mesopotamia and the Mediterranean, various Semitic peoples. So these were the two prominent groups. There were, of course, many others, such as Proto-Arabian people in the south, and various others which have been slightly harder to identify, such as the Gutians, the Lulubi, and perhaps later the Sumerians. These latter were popularized, of course, by Conan the Barbarian. And there are many others, but we will focus on these two groups primarily. So it is from these frontier people and their descendants that the greatest empire-building projects of the next great age of civilization would gradually arise. So I will look at the wider movement patterns in various lectures throughout the series of, say, 10 to 12 lectures, which will take us to about 500 BC till the rise of the Persian Empire of Cyrus the Great, which again will start a whole new cycle of lectures. So expect at least uh, one or two lectures for this cycle every week till we move on to the next cycle, perhaps next month or the month after. So in this opening presentation, I will engage with a question which is no doubt of a lot of interest to many listeners here regarding the presence of Indo-Europeans in the Indus Valley during the Harappan age. So the question we will be exploring is this, were there Indo-Europeans in the Indus Valley during the high age of the Harappan civilization? So let us look at some conjectures which will set the stage for future conversations. So a few miles from Mohanjodaro, there is another Harappan site at the village of Channudaro. Here, during excavations conducted in the mid-1930s, the American archaeologist Ernest Mackay found a remarkably well-preserved Indus Valley site, which revealed a variety of interesting artifacts and remains. Among them was evidence of possible foreign craftsmen or traders living at this site. But more interestingly, there was discovered here a seal depicting what, according to another archaeologist, F.R. Olchin, was the depiction of what we might call the Indo-Aryan origin myth, showing the marriage or, let's say, union of the Sky Father and the Earth Mother and the subsequent emergence of the world. Now, in this seal, the Sky Father is represented as a bull. The Earth Goddess, in a vegetative or plant-like feminine form, is shown as emerging from the Earth. Now, the interesting thing is that the bull has a dual representation of both the sky god, the sky father, and of the sky itself is seen as a motif found across Indo-European cultures. And this vegetative earth goddess is equally pervasive in many or most settled cultures across this vast region. So this seal is dated to between the 23rd to 20th century BC. And it might show, in the opinion of these scholars, the emergence of what we might call a syncretic belief, uniting two different religious themes between early Indo-European settlers in the Indus Valley and Harappans. So in his examination of the seal, Olchin says, F.R. Olchin, he's a great scholar and a writer and has written various books on the emergence of civilization, which I highly recommend. So what he says is, Several times in recent years, we have expressed our view that Indo-Aryan-speaking people must have arrived in the Indus Valley during the lifetime of the mature Indus Valley civilization, and that there must have been a period of cultural synthesis between the two very different elements. It is still not possible to say when the first Indo-Aryans arrived, nor over how long a period they continued to move into the Indus Valley region from, the, from their earlier homelands in Central Asia. But the model of this period of cultural interaction provides, in our view, the most plausible indication of the medium within which the sort of cultural synthesis suggested by the seal and the Rig Vedic myths would have taken place. In our expectation and belief, the further inquiries along these lines, investigating the same underlying hypothesis, may reveal further evidence to test its validity. And... In another analysis of this hypothesis, Gregory Purcell, who again is one of the leading archaeologists of the Indus Valley civilization, writes, 
While I do believe from linguistic evidence that the homeland of the Indo-European peoples was somewhere in the temperate forest regions of Eurasia, so they came to the subcontinent from somewhere else. But when the speakers of an Indo-European language or various languages first came to the subcontinent is not known. They first appear in the Near East just after 2000 BC. But this is from linguistic evidence only and they could, they could have been there much before, as would be the case for the Indian subcontinent. I am in agreement with F.R. Olchin that there could have been Indo-European speaking peoples in the greater Indus region at the time of the Indus Valley Civilization. It is unlikely that they were speakers of Vedic Sanskrit and it is therefore also doubtful that they were Indo-Aryans since that is what the speakers of the Vedic Sanskrit called themselves. But when the speakers of Vedic Sanskrit came to the subcontinent, it is also obscure. However, the Rig Veda does not contain the story or even a hint of the Aryan journey to the Punjab. No one knows for sure when the Indo-Europeans who spoke Vedic Sanskrit came to the subcontinent or how they got here. Speakers of other Indo-European languages were in the Near East early in the second millennium and this may approximate the date of the Aryans or the arrival of the Aryans into the subcontinent. But as of now there is no evidence for an invasion and most contemporary scholars who deal with this issue Think more in terms of the movement that characterizes cattle pastoralists because of their need for pasture land than military conquest. Moreover, the Aryans may have come to the Punjab over a long period of time, a matter of centuries, not in a great rush, as an invasion would suggest. So there is a lot to analyze and unpack here. Let's do a little bit of that now. So this hypothesis, which again, scholars who study the Indus Valley civilization as archaeologists have proposed, it suggests that and gives evidence to the hypothesis that various groups of Indo-European language speaking people might have been dispersed over the Indian subcontinent in waves much before the earlier assumption of the mid second millennium BC march to India. A much more logical model suggests that there was both inward and outward movement, particularly as a consequence of war and trade during the entire third millennium BC. And we have discussed these cycles at length. We have spoken about various artifacts found in the greater Indus Valley region, possibly related to early variations of the Indo-Aryan culture, primarily along the Indus periphery in the present day Afghanistan, which became home to the Bactria Margiana archaeological complex, again which began to emerge from around 2000 BC. But further recent excavations in places like Sinali in northern India have added still more information to our corpus. So. My personal view is that these are traces of movements which might represent groups of frontier people employed as mercenaries or perhaps even traders and merchants by the people of the cities of the Harappan civilization. But equally, they could have been people who lived in the countryside surrounding the cities for a long time. So two civilizations in a sense of the urban culture and a civilization of the rural culture might have overlapped. In fact, there is some evidence of this in more eastern regions of the Indus, such as the city of Rakhigadi, we find evidence of fire altars which might have been used for worship, a feature seen repeated across various Indo-European cultures. And these exist at the periphery of the city. So it might suggest that there were settlers in the countryside moving into the cities and living on the periphery, and these settlers might have carried a different religion. Or let's not call this a religion, but a different way of worship different form of worship because they were of course dwellers in the vast open spaces rather than cult worshippers who generally tend to cluster together in cities as we've explored for numerous cities of both the Indus and also of Mesopotamia. So as Purcell says, as Olchin agrees, there are traces of Indo-Europeans in the Indus Valley around the 2000 BC mark and as Purcell also says there is no way to tell how long this process occurred over a long period of time. At least there is no evidence to suggest that there was a great rush or an invasion. And as we will discuss in future lectures, the decline phase of the Indus Valley civilization was also stretched out. It began from sometime around the 1900 BC mark and stretched out right into 1700 BC and perhaps even into 1600 BC in many places. So there was a long period of interaction and long period of overlap between these two successive forms of civilization in the greater Indian subcontinental region. 
And because there was such a long period of overlap, remember, for, for centuries, we should ask the question whether it is right for us to make divisions between this period or whether this was just part of one continuum to which one civilization transitions over a long period of time. So these are ideas and themes that we will continue to explore throughout this series of lectures. But I should briefly address another issue which is uh, undoubtedly going to arise. I know there is a lot of uh, heated debate about the origins of Indo-Europeans and this has gotten so confused with racial, religious and political overtones over time that much of this debate has now moved far from its real frame of reference. So first of all, to clarify that, we should remember that the term Indo-European is a linguistic category and refers to a group of related languages. That should be clear. Now, Where these languages originated is a matter of debate. But they can be broadly triangulated around the Indus to Oxus to Caspian Black Sea region, spilling over here and there. And that is also settled. Because this is where the Indo-European languages first enter the historical record. And also where they begin to inscribe themselves into the land, so to say, as toponyms or places, place names and names of various regions. So you might identify an Aryavarta in northern India. You might identify an Aryana in uh, Afghanistan. And of course, there is Iran, where the word still continues to, to exist in a different, slightly modified form. So again, these are not questions of debate. But just as in previous eras, there was a confusion regarding race and culture, in, these, in our times, there is a trend of making hasty correlations between archaeogenetics and language and culture. Well, this is an interesting field. Archaeogenetics is uh, really interesting, and it tells us a lot about the movement of people and population groups. You must remember there is no one-to-one -one relationship between language and genes, which is the primary source of information that archaeogenetic uses. Language is cultural, genes are biological. Now, for instance, in Mesopotamia, we see throughout the third millennium BC, language shifts between large demographic groups adopting regional languages for writing and record making. So pastoralists move into Mesopotamia they adopt the local language and they begin to use that local language to write the historical records. And of course, when we read these historical records, we tend to assume that that was the primary language of the region. But again, we can trace this linguistic shift between different demographic groups, smaller groups and larger groups throughout the third millennium BC. So again, there is no one-to-one -one relation between demographic groups and languages. And this should be reiterated time and again. So yes, uh, genetics is an interesting field and we should not throw out the information that it provides us. But that information should be taken along with other evidence, historic, archaeological, even literary, artistic, and then anthropological if needed. So a second question that might also arise is, so does the evidence we have presented here mean that the Harappan civilization was an Indo-Aryan civilization? Now again, this is a controversial subject, especially when we factor in the debate regarding the origins of Hinduism which sometimes gets convoluted with the so-called Aryan invasion theory. Now, this theory from the early 20th century was already redundant decades ago, and no archaeologist or historian who actually studies the Indus Valley civilization believes in this theory. And I just read that quote from Gregory Purcell, where the migration model is the one we have most evidence for. And now we have a lot more evidence for that migration model. So let me just speak about the origins of Hinduism. Now, there is enough evidence to suggest that many core components of what we today call the Hindu faith and the practice of the Hindu faith are already observable in the deep past of the greater Indus Valley civilization, perhaps beginning even before the Harappan age. So let's not get confused about various categories and temporal shifts here. But what we know about the Harappan religion suggests that there was a lot of diversity in religious practices between various, various regions and even within cities themselves. Now, the cemeteries of Harappa and Mohenjo-daro give us evidence of this in different types of burial practices, and burial and funeral practices are closely, closely related to religion. In fact, that is where the idea of religion, in fact, originates deep in the Stone Age. Now, inscriptions and art of this entire great region reveals a rich and complex symbology, which was already shared across cultures, across these archaic and ancient cultures, across the ancient world. And as I have uh, said and hopefully shown that by the third millennium BC, the world was already globalized and all the processes that we see today were already happening then, although at a slower pace. So just as we have the wide dispersal of religion, culture 
and various other forms of communication and devotion across the world today, it happened even then, although at a slower pace. So what we in fact see as civilization progresses through eras in time is that there is this sort of time-space compression due to technological advances. And as change happens, time and space, time becomes quicker and space becomes more and more confined. So that is something technical. But this is what it means to study the world as a system and world history as a system, which is somewhat different from the historical approach, by which I mean the approach of history writing or historiography in history departments. Now, history writing generally proceeded till some time ago with this idea that history had to be periodized into ages. But that is something that has to be done. That is a narrative that has to be created. And not always due to uh, any ulterior motives, but that is just the way that this field progressed. And a lot in that has changed in recent times. But in fact, when we go into the historical record, when we go into the archaeological record, we see that rather than this periodization or this revolution model of history, we see that many parallel timelines, in fact, many parallel timelines of different cultures occur simultaneously in this entire space historical space of the world system that we are studying. And we have to reckon with that, that there are different movements of time, just like there are different aspects of different regions in this entire world system. And that is something that we have to factor in when we try to understand history over long, long ranges of time and over wide spaces. So, as we approach 2000 BC, since we see more and more signs of what would become the proto-Vedic culture, especially found around the northern Indus region, we have to factor in the possibility that there were overlapping civilizations in this vast space. Remember, Harappan civilization was confined to the cities and grew from the city of Harappa, in fact, became the dominant ideology over the region. But there were pre-existing cultures and there were perhaps other cultures which existed in the gaps between these cities. Now, we only begin to record these cultures once they emerge in the historical record, again, in written form. But the genesis of these cultures has a long and deep history, which is something we must also take into account. So for instance, we know from recent scientific surveys that the Saraswati River flowed till around 1800 BC. And since that river is featured so prominently in the Rig Veda, the scripture itself must have been composed sometime around this period, in fact, before this period. Now the linguist uh, Michael Witzel, who has studied the Veda in, in depth says, that uh, the genesis of the Rig Veda perhaps took centuries and before it was finally compiled into the form that we have today. So perhaps this genesis was occurring simultaneously with the Harappan civilization. So there is definitely the centuries long overlap between the Vedic and Harappan era, which we will take into account as we move into the future. So in light of this, we can safely say that Proto-Vedic culture was at least one of the cultures of the greater Indus Valley towards the close of the third the beginning of the second millennium BC. Now, how this became the dominant culture over all the Indian subcontinent in the millennia that followed is a process that we will continue to explore in this series of lectures. And of course, we will do this in a comparative way by comparing similar processes occurring across this entire vast region between the Indus Oxus and the Mediterranean.